So welcome you all. Can you hear me well? I have started recording. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is the 12th talk of uh, astrophysical talk series or organized by Istanbul University Observatory. And in the 12th uh, talk, our speaker is Dr. Debarati uh, Chatterji, who is a theoretical astrophysicist, associate professor at Inter University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics. And uh, she is chair of LIGO India Education and Public Outreach. Her expertise is uh, to develop analytical and computational models of compact stars. Uh, she is the owner of Unified Models for Neutron Stars and Nuclei that is announced in 2017. Uh, she has many public talks, publications, and she will give a, a presentation title, Hints from Multidisciplinary Physics to Probe Neutron Star Interior, today to us. So, uh, Dr. Debarati or Debbie, is it your turn now? You can start uh, sharing your screen and uh, I will ask all the audience to turn their microphone and uh, camera off. Thank you very much, first of all, uh, for inviting me uh, to present my recent work at uh, the Istanbul University Observatory Astrophysics Talks. It's my real pleasure to, to be able to share uh, my uh, research experience with you. And um, yeah, so uh, please feel free to ask me questions. I will share screen. Uh, you, you can always interrupt me um, in the middle of my talk if you have any questions. So, um, all right. So uh, yeah, like uh, like already I was introduced. So I am associate professor at uh, the institute, uh, which is called Ayuka in Pune in India. And uh, I'm also chairperson of education and public outreach for the upcoming LIGO India project. Uh, so it's a real pleasure for me to present my latest work with you. So this work uh, was done in collaboration with Professor Jürgen Schaffner Bielisch from Institute uh, for Theoretical Physics at Frankfurt University in Germany, and uh, as well as with my PhD students, uh, Shuprabhu Ghosh and Bikram uh, Pradhan from Ayuka. So um, uh, the basic idea of this work uh, is to find uh, some hints from multidisciplinary physics at different densities and to use that information to probe uh, what is the composition of neutron stars. So let me um, tell you a little bit more about the background of this work. So uh, some of you might already know the story of neutron stars begins with uh, this uh, young lady, uh, Jocelyn Bell, who had uh, discovered this object back in 1967 when she was a PhD student at Cambridge University. When she was hunting for quasars, she came upon these uh, jiggles uh, in the radio signal, which today we know came from uh, what we call pulsars or neutron stars. So um, we already know now that neutron stars are objects which are left behind at the end point of evolution of massive stars, which go through supernova explosion. So these are uh, basically supported by quantum degeneracy pressure of neutrons. And uh, so these um, enigmatic objects are what uh, are the central theme of, of my talk today. So uh, neutron stars are one of uh, these compact objects, uh, which are produced at the end point of uh, the life of massive stars. The reason we are studying the, these stars is that neutron stars are actually like cosmic observatories, cosmic laboratories that allow us to probe very extreme properties in physics. Just to give you an idea about uh, what, how extreme the physics in neutron stars is. Um, neutron stars typically have masses which are about that of the sun or about two times as massive as the sun. But the radius of these objects is only about 10 kilometers. It's about a city. So imagine crushing the sun to a small radius of only 10 kilometers. 
just a back of the envelope calculation will tell you that the density inside these objects is extremely, extremely high. So these objects are more dense than anything that you can even imagine any laboratory or any facility that can be built here on Earth yet. So this is the densest form of matter in the universe. Not only that, neutron stars have also many other exotic properties. They also have very low temperatures. So we imagine that uh, we can even have superfluidity inside the interior of neutron stars because these are such cold objects. Neutron stars also rotate extremely rapidly and their uh, periodicity is also very accurate. They are one of the most accurate clocks in the universe. Also, uh, the magnetic field in neutron stars can be extremely high. And in a certain class of neutron stars called magnetars, these could even be 1,000 times higher. So this tells you that neutron stars are one of the very attractive objects in the universe that we want to study in order to push the limits of our knowledge in extreme kinds of physics. So uh, this is uh, the picture of the neutron star interior that we have today. So if you look at uh, the star, the cross section of the star going from the surface towards the interior, you will encounter these many layers with increasing density towards the center. So the outer layers have nuclei, something like uh, iron nuclei. And this is something uh, that we understand from nuclear experiments. So these nuclei are embedded in a sea of electrons. But as we go towards the interior, the density increases. And because of the density, uh, there are the, the nuclei become more and more neutron rich as we go towards the center. So these may or may not be studied in certain experiments. So there are a few uh, rare experiments on Earth which study very neutron rich nuclei. So we have a little bit of an idea of what this kind of material can act like. But then as you can see here, a cross section of the crust of the outer layers of the neutron star. So as we go from the surface towards the interior, so as we have more and more neutron rich nuclei, the neutrons start to even drip out of the nuclei. So this is something which is called the inner crust. But not only that, as the density increases even further, these nuclei start to become deformed in very strange shapes, uh, which are finally called pasta phases because they look like spaghetti and uh, meatballs and, and cheese-like structures. And then finally, with even increasing density, this, uh, these deformed nuclei ultimately uh, dissolved into a uniform fluid composed mainly of neutrons, which is why it's called a neutron star, and also a small fraction of protons and electrons uh, in, order to, um, in order to restore charge neutrality. Now, uh, all the density, the highest density we talked about until now is about that of nuclear density or about two to three times that of uh, nuclear density. But within the inner core of neutron star, we exceed this nuclear density up to even 10 times. And uh, in fact, we have no idea of what could be the composition of the interior or the core of a neutron star because this is something which is way beyond the reach of current terrestrial experiments. There are many models which, uh, so we have to turn to models because uh, this is something that cannot be proved directly. But I will tell you what are the challenges of uh, constructing models of the neutron star core. So um, we know that uh, the matter that surrounds us is composed of atoms. And if you look inside atoms, there are nuclei and electrons. If you look further into electrons, there are protons and neutrons. And inside protons and neutrons, there are these sub-atomic uh, particles, sub-nuclear particles called quarks. So the standard model of nuclear phys uh, of physics tells us uh, what is the most likely component, comp composition of uh, matter that surrounds us. So this kind of, um, um, so there are different experiments that can probe inside um, at high energies, they can probe inside uh, atoms and nuclei in order to give us an idea of what subatomic structure of matter is. 
So let's start with terrestrial nuclear experiments. So nuclear experiments give us certain empirical observables, something like saturation density. So this is basically the density at which um, the nuclear force saturates. What is the energy per particle or what is the binding energy of such nuclei? Then uh, there are other uh, nuclear observables as well, which are uh, which can be probed in terrestrial nuclear experiments. With the, uh, these are done by measuring a number of different uh, nuclear observables, like the neutron skin thickness, uh, electric dipole polarizability, giant and monopole dipole, uh, giant um, uh, dipole resonance or monopole resonance, and so on. So this gives us an idea about certain uh, nuclear empirical observables. So this is those terrestrial nuclear experiments told us about the properties of matter around nuclear saturation density. There are other more energetic experiments, uh, such as uh, um, the heavy ion collision experiments. You might have heard about the CERN experiment. There is the FAIR facility, which is coming up at GSI in Germany. There is the Ganil facility in France and so on. So there are all these heavy ion collision experiments, also called accelerators, where um, you can obtain matter, which is at uh, large densities. So about two to three times more dense than you know, nuclear densities. But these are, again, these have uh, the same number of neutrons and protons. So uh, these kind of accelerator experiments also tells us uh, about strangeness production. So strangeness production is something which is uh, seen only momentarily in heavy ion collisions. Uh, normally, in, um, uh, we are surrounded by matter which is devoid of strangeness because uh, the environment around us is not that dense. So the kind of uh, matter we have around us is composed mainly of up and down quarks, whereas uh, the environment such as heavy ion collision experiments, or it is also thought that uh, neutron star interior, this is an environment which is extremely dense. And therefore, strangeness uh, due to the presence of strange quarks can be something which is a stable component of uh, neutron star matter. So um, the reason why we cannot directly interpret this, uh, all this information to build uh, models of neutron stars is the following. So uh, all these different types of experiments give us an idea about uh, the behavior of matter. Uh, the, using standard model, we, we know that uh, basically matter can be described with the help of quantum chromodynamics. And this is what the phase diagram of quantum chromodynamics looks like. So basically, this is nothing but a plot of density as a function of temperature. So nuclear densities, so the, if the x-axis is plotted uh, with respect to saturation density, then all these nuclear experiments give us information around nuclear saturation density. Um, again, heavy ion collision experiments, what we talked about, this is something which is at finite densities and finite temperatures. But uh, neutron stars, so neutron stars are objects which lie on this axis because they are zero temperature, they are very cold and they are uh, extremely dense. So they can go up to 10 times saturation density. But then there is another challenge. So there is also the fact that neutron stars are composed mainly of neutrons. So the number of neutrons in neutron stars exceeds by far the number of protons. This is not the case when it comes to nuclei and heavy ion collisions. So we have two uncertainties in our model. One is the, the uh, uncertainty with density, and the other is the uncertainty with the difference in neutron and proton number. This is also called the symmetry energy. So basically, there are these two uncertainties, which, uh, which do not allow us to um, completely determine the interior of neutron stars. So um, we can so what, do I, what can we do in that case? What we can do in that case is build theoretical models, make predictions, and then compare them with observations, what we already have seen or measured in uh, astrophysical data. Uh, 
So uh, luckily, neutron stars are something which can be seen throughout the electromagnetic spectrum. So um, all the way from gamma rays to X-rays, uh, infrared, microwave, and radio, neutron stars can be observed uh, with the help of many different ground-based and space-based facilities. So all this give us an idea about uh, different um, uh, information about the neutron star. For example, in this image of the crab pulsar that you see inside the crab nebula, you see that uh, if you look in the radio or uh, in other, uh, so for example, ultraviolet or visible frequencies, you see the dust in the nebula. Whereas in the X-ray, you can see the interior of the nebula and you can, you can uh, observe the pulsar that is lying uh, inside the crab nebula. So just like this, uh, multi-wavelength astronomy gives us a lot of information about uh, many different astrophysical observables, which are related to neutron stars. For example, uh, pulsars, so these are uh, basically rotating neutron stars. If we observe, if we receive the pulses from these uh, periodically rotating objects, then we can very accurately determine their spin period. If uh, there are objects uh, like neutron stars in binary with other stars or other neutron stars, we can determine their masses very accurately. Um, from the spectral lines, we can determine their compactness. Compactness is something which is the ratio of the mass to the radius of the object. Uh, from thermal properties, we can determine its temperature. Uh, from uh, flares and outbursts, we can determine its magnetic field and so on. Uh, recently, there has also been uh, a lot of breakthrough with a recently launched NICER mission from NASA. NICER means uh, Neutron Star Interior Composition Explorer, and uh, it has started to give very accurate data on the VDI of neutron stars. So now, uh, what do we do with all this information? What we need to do is make a connection between the interior composition and the exterior uh, global observables. So, um, for example, if we um, a key entity that um, determines um, what the interior composition or how to link the interior composition with the um, global properties is called the equation of state. So equation of state is nothing but the relationship between the pressure of the neutron star and its density. So how does it give us information? Uh, it gives us information in the following way. So for example, we have a model, a certain um, kind of interaction which describes, uh, uh, which describes um, the, the microscopic state of the, of the neutron star. So now uh, using, um, so for example, we can, uh, using that equation of state, we can solve uh, equilibrium hydrostatic equations, also called uh, TOD equations, in order to obtain its uh, mass and radius or its global structure. So um, just to give you an idea, if you have only neutrons and protons inside the neutron star core and no strangeness, then you will have a stiff equation of state. Stiff means that you have a steep curve of the pressure as a function of density. And this translates to a very high mass uh, as a function of radius. On the other hand, if you have some additional exotic components like uh, strangeness containing matter like hyperons or kaons or quarks, then these will reduce the pressure, they will make the equation of state softer, and correspondingly the mass as a function of radius will also decrease. So this is, uh, so this equation of state is something which connects the mi microscopic description of the star with the macroscopic uh, global uh, astrophysical description that can be actually measured in astrophysical data. Now, uh, the challenge uh, is that uh, the, uh, the problem with this is that uh, there are many different equations of state. I already talked about the uncertainties like uh, that are related to uh, theoretical models of neutron stars. And uh, so because of this large number of equations of state, uh, we are not able to determine exactly what is the interior composition because what is, um, there is a degeneracy there. If you have uh, different equations of state which give you the same mass or the same rate 
then you cannot distinguish between which version of state is correct and which one is not. Now, um, is the, the problem is that all these astrophysical observables we were talking about, which are giving which are obtained from information throughout the electromagnetic spectrum, they are all obtained from the surface, mostly from the exterior part of the neutron star. So is there any way to look directly into the interior or the core of a neutron star? So this um, is something that was addressed by uh, Einstein back in 1915. So it's uh, because of his idea of general theory of relativity that we can probe the interior of neutron stars today. So the idea that was proposed by Einstein back in general uh, in 1915 in his uh, general theory of relativity is the fact that uh, objects like neutron stars, which are very dense, so neutron stars, white dwarfs, black holes, these are extremely relativistic or extremely dense, and um, gravity in general theory of rel relativity is not a force, but it is related to the properties of space-time around uh, the object. So um, in the case of these extremely compact objects, they bend the, the shape, the curvature of space-time around them, and that is what gives them uh, the strong gravity. So if there is any perturbation on the surface of such objects or on the surface of the, of the fabric of space-time, these will generate gravitational waves. So this was a postulate of the general theory of relativity proposed by Einstein back in 1915. Now, um, the, the direct um, corollary of this theory is that if there are compact bodies binaries which are merging like neutron stars or black holes that are in binary, if they come closer and closer to each other, they will emit gravitational waves. So the, the trick is that if these gravitational waves can be captured, they should contain information about the interior of such objects. Now the challenge was whether or not we can actually um, measure or actually uh, detect such faint gravitational waves. The first attempt that happened successfully was that from uh, Joseph Taylor and Russell Hulse back in 1974, when they studied the binary system, now, uh, which is now named after them, called the Hulse-Taylor pulsar. So what they did was they measured the change in the relative um, trajectory of this uh, binary system of pulsars as they are losing gravitational waves. So they, they actually um, uh, measured this um, change in their orbital, fre orbital frequency or orbital period. And what they found was that the prediction exactly follows that of general relativity, which means that gravitational waves were being emitted by this binary system, and which is why, which was causing the shrinking of the orbit. So this was the first indirect evidence of existence of gravitational waves. And because of this discovery, uh, Taylor and Hulse won the Nobel Prize in 1971, sorry, 1991. But uh, of course, this uh, resulted in a lot of excitement in the community because now that we know that the gravitational waves exist and they are being emitted by these uh, binary neutron stars, um, I mean, not only binary, gravitational waves are also emitted by perturbed, uh, perturbed um, compact objects. But then in this case, it was already indirectly seen. So now the question was whether or not we can directly observe uh, this kind of gravitational waves. So um, there was a, a global effort to build a large number of detectors. Um, finally, uh, uh, LIGO, uh, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, started to become, uh, started to be uh, uh, built or um, constructed in the US uh, in two sites, as you can see in the pictures in Hanford and Livingston. And simultaneously, the Virgo uh, Observatory was also built in Europe in the uh, Italy France border. And the idea was that uh, just like an interferometer, if you have very long arms, like uh, four kilometer long arms, like in an L shape, where uh, if 
so what happens is if a gravitational wave would pass this kind of, a, of an interferometer, then uh, the light coming out of the laser would be uh, split into along two arms of this interferometer. They would be reflected back from the end of these L-shaped arms to finally um, uh, reach a photo detector where they would be detected. So if any gravitational wave, uh, even if it's very faible, it passes through such a detector, it will cause a relative change in this arm length, and therefore this would be detected. So with this basic idea, um, um, there were um, efforts to detect gravitational waves, but the problem was that these gravitational waves are extremely elusive. So you can look at this characteristic strain in this figure as a function of frequency, and you can see that they are as low as 10 to the minus 22, 10 to the minus 23. Um, and uh, neutron stars we are, uh, that we are aiming for, they have frequencies which are close to about 1 to 100 hertz. Now, um, the question is how to build a detector which is that sensitive. Of course, it did not happen in a day. It took uh, more than a decade in order to gradually uh, reach the sensitivity of this object. Um, and um, so going from LIGO to advanced LIGO, advanced PURGO, and finally, uh, you can see that uh, the sensitivity curves uh, for LIGO and advanced LIGO, you can see how much um, uh, actually was required in terms of technological advance in 10 years in order to achieve such uh, a precise characteristic strain measurement. So this is something which is absolutely a technological and engineering uh, uh, marvel because uh, it required the best precision measurement or best precision technology in, in lasers, in uh, suspension systems, in optics, and much, much more. So finally, uh, with advanced LIGO, um, the first direct gravitational wave detection happened from a binary uh, black hole merger. So this happened uh, in, on 14 September 2015. And uh, it was announced on 11th of February 2016. So the rest is history. We know that um, the Nobel Prize in Physics for this uh, direct detection of gravitational waves was awarded in 2017 to uh, Barry Barish, Rhino Weiss, and Kip Thorne. And uh, this groundbreaking ob observation led to the opening of an entirely new uh, window to the universe. So, um, of course, the biggest surprise came in 2017 when the first neutron star merger was detected. And this neutron star merger, also called GW170817, because it was observed on 17th of August 2017, uh, this was a, a miracle in many senses because the same uh, observation in gravitational waves uh, was uh, followed up in electromagnetic signals in uh, many other frequencies. And uh, so uh, it was confirmed that uh, basically neutron star mergers are also associated with short gamma ray bursts. They are associated with kilonova. Um, and it was also confirmed that neutron star mergers are also the site of our process photo nucleosynthesis, sorry. So um, this was an event, one particular event that led to many, many different um, uh, confirmations of theoretical models of hypothesis. And it was absolute breakthrough in terms of uh, both astrophysics as well as uh, all the associated fields that, um, that are uh, associated with neutron stars. So uh, just to give you an example, this event also told us a lot of, it gave us a lot of information about the equation of state as well. So um, when the neutron stars are merging, so these, um, because of the strong gravity, they tidally deform each other. And this tidal deformation of neutron stars also depends on its interior composition. So basically by measuring its tidal deformability, we can also say something about its um, about the equation of state as well as about its interior composition. So um, 
So in this talk, I will particularly talk about a couple of papers that have recently been uh, published. Um, so uh, which explore the hints that come from multidisciplinary physics in order to probe the neutron star interior. So um, the first one was published at the, in the European Physical Journal, and the second one was published recently in the Frontiers for Astronomy and Space Sciences. So what is the idea we are exploring in this paper, in, in this couple of papers? So the idea was this, that uh, basically um, multi-physics constraints um, were uh, imposed by uh, within a Bayesian analysis scheme. And uh, these constraints are imposed at different density regimes in order to constrain the nuclear parameter space of the equation of state model. So if you look at uh, this figure again, which is the same QCD phase diagram, you can see that we are actually talking about different density regimes and information coming from very different sources. So we already talked about nuclear experiments, right? So nuclear experiments give us information around uh, nuclear saturation density. So what we did was we adopted a model which, uh, which is based on uh, the relativistic mean field model. And uh, we explored the parameter space of this, of uh, the nuclear, uh, of, um, we explored the parameter space of this equation of state model within current uncertainties of nuclear experiments. Then we imposed other um, constraints coming from, uh, uh, for example, uh, multi messenger astrophysical data. So we talked about uh, mass, radius, um, et cetera, which are. Um, observables coming, which are measured in astrophysical data. So these are at high densities and at intermediate densities, we considered heavy ion collision experiments. So we said that heavy ion collision experiments are giving us information of matter around two to three times saturation density. So this is something we consider at intermediate density regime. And beyond uh, three times saturation density, we have these astrophysical constraints. So basically, um, we have uh, these different constraints. So one is the nuclear model that we are exploring. Uh, there is also, we also imposed uh, the latest um, a, a theoretical um, information coming from the chiral effective field theory model. So this is also a model which is very successful recently in describing uh, the properties of uh, pure neutron matter, which is um, at densities, at very low densities. And uh, at intermediate densities, we will look at three different experiments which have been performed at the GSI experiment in Germany. And uh, at high densities, we will consider certain astrophysical data, like the maximum mass of neutron stars, uh, the tidal deformability that I talked about from gravitational wave sources, and also we check for compatibility with the latest NICER mission, which measures neutron star radii. So what did we uh, do? So the methodology goes like this. So like I already said, microscopic description. So this is uh, what we also call the equation of state. So this, uh, for this particular study, we use something uh, called the relativistic mean field model. So this is nothing but a phenomenological model, which means that uh, this model has certain parameters that can be adjusted in order to reproduce nuclear experimental observables. We consider two types of matter. We considered uh, nuclear matter as well as matter containing hyperons, which is a strangeness containing uh, matter. Um, so we took a variety or a range of nuclear empirical parameters uh, in order to fix our model parameters. And this range of nuclear empirical parameters is the state of the art um, uncertainty in nuclear experimental data. Uh, once we have the equation of state, after fixing the parameters, then as we said before, we can connect the microscopic description with the macroscopic description by solving some uh, equilibrium equations like TOB equations in order to obtain the mass, the radius, or tidal deformability of this star. So um, 
once we have the microscopic and macroscopic description for this range of nuclear parameters, now we apply the Bayesian scheme. So what do we mean by that? We mean that first we have, so in the Bayesian scheme, what is done is that um, there is a prior, which means that you have, um, after varying all these uh, different parameters, you have a large number of models which are uh, allowed by the present uncertainty. And then you have to apply uh, some likelihood functions. In our case, the likelihood functions are like filter functions, which must be satisfied in order to um, reproduce certain um, conditions. And then the posterior that comes out after passing through the filter functions, these are used to explore correlations between the nuclear parameters and the astrophysical observables. So in this case, what we did was we first started with um, our equation of state model. We varied the nuclear uh, parameters in a large range so that uh, we have the priors. Then we pass them through these different filters that we talked about. In lo at low density, we have the chiral effective field theory. At intermediate density, we have these three different heavy ion collision experiments uh, from GSI that we are considering. They are called the chaos experiment, the FOPI experiment, and the ACUS experiment. And at large density, we are considering the astrophysical observables from uh, the masses, uh, the maximum mass uh, measured from neutron stars, and the tidal deformability from gravitational wave observations. So once we pass our uh, large number of input parameters through these filter functions, what we obtain are the posteriors. So with the posteriors, we plotted these different um, correlation plots. So you can see on the left-hand side, uh, so these are uh, the first few, so N0, ESAT, KSAT, ESIM, LSIM, all these are nuclear uh, saturation parameters and uh, R1.4, lambda 1.4, these are all uh, observables of uh, the neutron star, so radius and tidal deformability at uh, different masses, so 1.4 solar mass or 2 solar mass and so on. So um, what we found from this kind of uh, study were uh, very interesting. And so we can uh, find these conclusions by comparing the two different correlation plots. The first correlation plot has only chiral effective field theory plus astrophysical observables. On top of that, we also add the filter from heavy ion collision at intermediate density. We kept this separate because heavy ion collision experiments have uncertainty associated with modeling. Therefore, we did not want to, um, uh, we wanted to keep the comparison separate. So um, through our study, what we found were the following. So first, we made some plots of the symmetry energy. So this is something, uh, the symmetry energy slope is a key parameter, um, as well as the effective nuclear mass is a key parameter. So what we found was that not all points are allowed in this parameter space, um, only um, so the points which are corresponding to low slope and low effective mass are ruled out by this um, kind of, uh, I mean, they, are, they do not allow physical models. Uh, you can see from the correlation plot certain things. So for example, we found a strong correlation between the symmetry energy and its slope. So ESIM and LSIM, so these are two nuclear parameters which show strong correlation. Um, at saturation density, but after applying heavy and collision filters, we found that this correlation is weakened. Um, we also found that um, the radius of a 1.4 solar mass neutron star has low correlation with symmetry energy, but high correlation with effective mass. This also tells us something about the nuclear equation of state. Um, we found the nuclear saturation density has a good correlation with the effective mass and also astrophysical observables. And we found that high correlation between the astrophysical observables is also something which is consistent with uh, what we expect because um, uh, the tidal deformability is actually proportional to the radius. So this is something which is expected. So you see this red block uh, on the bottom right of the um, 
correlation plot. Um, similarly, we found for hyperon matter, so including strangeness, we also repeated the same um, exercise and we found some new um, conclusions from our study on nuclear physics. So we found that inclusion of hyperons, we, we checked that uh, the posteriors that um, correspond to astrophysical and chirality field theory filters and those of heavy ion collision filters do not um, overlap. So they overlap over a very small range of effective uh, nucleon mass. And um, from this, we can conclude that the inclusion of hyperon shifts the posterior of effective mass to a lower value to satisfy the astrophysical constraints. But with heavy ion collision filters, the blue lines, this favors higher effective mass value. So the inclusion of hyperon generates a tension between astrophysical and heavy ion collision constraints. So basically for hyperon matter, we see that there is a tension, which means that the values of effective nucleon mass, which are which correspond to astrophysical filters, do not correspond to the same for heavy ion collision filters. Um, again, we found a strong correlation between symmetry energy and its slope, and this is something which has been um, postulated many times in the literature, and uh, we found that this does not hold true once we include the heavy ion collision filters. Uh, the radius of the 1.4 solar mass neutron star was found to have a low correlation with symmetry energy and effective mass, which was not found in the purely nucleonic case. Uh, there was an increase in correlation between effective mass and incompressibility, another saturation property of matter because of the chaos heavy ion collision filter. And uh, we did not find any correlation between hyperon potentials. So the potentials which control the threshold of hyperon uh, production in neutron stars and astrophysical observables. So this part was a bit technical, but this is basically um, the effect of the Bayesian study, which tells us a lot about uh, each particular, um, the correlation be between each of these nuclear saturation parameters and the observable quantities like radius and tidal deformability of uh, neutron stars. And uh, so this is telling us a lot of um, information about the nuclear parameter space that we want uh, to, to constrain. So in summary, uh, what I talked about in this uh, two particular papers, uh, uh, recent publications, was that, uh, so uh, the basis, the, uh, the framework we used was a phenomenological mean field model. We imposed constraints from nuclear theory and experiments uh, at low densities multi-messenger astrophysical observations at high densities and heavy ion collisions at intermediate densities. And with the help of these filter functions, we constrained the equation of state parameter space that is used to that was used to study correlations among these different nuclear and hypernuclear empirical parameters with neutron star observables. So what are the implications of the study? So the constrained parameter space we obtained gives us an informed choice of parameters in that can be useful in astrophysical and numerical relativity simulations. Um, in this work, particularly, we found that among different nuclear empirical parameters, the saturation density and effective nucleon mass were the essential parameters that must be varied in simulations. And also, one must remember that heavy and collision constraints that we talked about are less robust and model dependent. So these um, conclusions should be um, taken into account with a grain of salt. Um, okay, finally, a word about uh, the LIGO India Observatory. So I talked about the LIGO Hanford and LIGO Livingston um, sites, as well as the Virgo uh, in Europe. So along with these facilities, recently Kagra has started operation in Japan. Uh, the LIGO India project is coming up uh, in India, and uh, this project is supposed to give uh, better sensitivity and better um, uh, better sensitivity and source localization with respect to uh, because of its position with respect to other detectors. 
So um, this, uh, in addition with the upcoming third generation detectors, uh, such as Einstein telescope and cosmic explorer, there is also the proposed uh, mission in Australia called NEMO. So um, all these uh, different facilities are going to enrich our uh, knowledge about gravitational waves coming from neutron stars, um, as well as um, as well as those um, coming from other sources. Um, and uh, therefore, these are also going to help us to constrain um, our information about compact stars. And finally, uh, if you want to know more about LIGO India, you can visit uh, the ligoindia.in slash gravity matters. So this is a blog page, uh, which um, covers a large variety of different topics. Uh, it talks about LIGO India science, so gravitational wave science related to LIGO India. You can read about neutron stars, black holes, and uh, quantum gravity, and many more topics like that. Uh, there is a podcast called Listening to the Cosmos, which uh, interviews gravitational wave experts from all over the world. Um, there is a section also called Glorious Women, which um, uh, highlights the uh, participation and contributions from women of all levels in gravitational wave science. Um, there is also um, a behind the scenes, which has interviews of gravitational wave students. So uh, if you are a student and you would want to know what it is like to be a gravitational wave uh, scholar, so you can also uh, watch these videos on YouTube. Um, there are also creative sections like gravitational wave sci art, where you have uh, scientific art um, in relation with gravitational wave science. And we also have a lot of events like this recent astrophotography webinar uh, series and contests that we had um, as a part of LIGO India outreach. So don't hesitate to to uh, visit ligoindia.in slash gravity matters um, to find out about the latest in uh, gravitational wave science and uh, LIGO India project. So um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Thanks a lot, uh, Devarati. This was very nice talk. Uh, if there is any question from audience, we can take, and there is already upper hands by Kai. Kai, it's uh, you, Yen. Hello. Hi. Thanks for the nice talk. Um, I have two questions. So the first one is, so you included uh, the heavy iron collision constraints, and these are typically at sufficient much higher temperature than what we would have in the neutron star. And I wonder, did you correct for this in some way, or did you just somehow use the data that we have? And um, yeah, so the study that I showed here, so the equation of state models we have used are zero temperature. Um, although um, the um, yeah, so for example, this chaos uh, experiment that I'm talking about. So earlier, um, I think in 2009, we had a paper with Jurgen and Irina Sagat and others, where we actually studied um, how to um, get information about the nuclear potential from the chaos experiment. So these are basically. Um, yeah, we are using we we were using different techniques. Uh, so, for example, for the chaos experiment, we used um, I mean uh, comparison of the SCRM model with uh, the uh, different models in order to extract the data. So we have I mean. Uh, of course, we know that all this heavy ion collision data is model dependent. We had to do the same even for ACOS and for P experiments, you know, from the papers that, uh, I mean, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty in these models with respect to um, what would be the, the, the um, energy per particle at a certain saturation density and so on. So of course, I mean, um, that's why I mentioned that, and that's why I kept also the heavy ion collision always separate uh, because of the uncertainties involved in these models. Uh, I mean, I'm talking about transport models as well as uh, interpretation of the data um, in, in this study. So this is why we kept the heavy ion collision separate. But yes, uh, the equation of state models we considered for this study are all zero temperature. And, and the other question I have is, 
um, say you use this particular relativistic mean field uh, model or say fitting set of fitting, fitting functions that you use then to do the analysis. And there are various others out there. I mean, one can do simple polytropes or whatever. And I wonder, mm -hmm. I mean, what's the difference? I mean, what do you get to see any qualitatively different results doing using this more, say, Baroque, um, say, model that you use that use, includes more physics, but it's surely in some sense also then more constrained because some things are simply fixed. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I wonder, is there anything qualitative depending on yeah. what kind of uh, parameterization you use? So, yeah, thanks for the question. So, um, of course, I didn't talk about, I only talked about one particular model that we adopted for this work, and there are, of course, other models. Uh, so, uh, I'm just comparing with the other models, like, for example, if you use microscopic models, you know that uh, for microscopic models, um, there are already, uh, like, three-body forces that are not known. Uh, so, the uncertainty, I mean, there is even a difficulty in explaining a two-solar mass neutron star. So, in that case, I mean, uh, so uh, we prefer to use a relativistic model. Um, so why this mean field model? The reason is that, um, so if uh, if you use a polytrope in this case, for example, I mean, there are many studies, which even if you look at the LIGO papers, there are all these parametric equation, parameterized equations of state, non-parameterized equations of state. So from if you instead used a polytropic equation of state, you could have got certain information about, say, the polytropic index. But what does it tell you about the nuclear physics? Nothing, right? So you cannot directly uh, relate it to the uh, underlying uh, nuclear physics. So this is why it was this motivation to use a relativistic mean field model with a model uh, with a parameter space large enough to accommodate the current uh, state of the art uncertainties and then to impose Bayesian filters in order to shrink in order to constrain that parameter space. And by plotting these different co uh, correlation plots, what we want to see is that what are the links between these individual uh, parameters uh, observable parameters and those of the observables. Like for example, here we found that there is no relation between the hyperon potentials and the observables. So okay, we know that this does not matter when we when it comes to simulations. Um, or for example, here we found that um, it's basically the effective nucleon mass, which is uh, more correlated with observables than the other parameters. So we already know that if we have simulations, then we need to have a better control or we need to have, uh, this is the parameter that we need to vary in order to uh, understand. Whereas in a polytrope, you would get a, a maybe a, um, a range of the polytropic index, but that does not tell you anything about the underlying nuclear physics. I mean, I surely didn't mean a single polytrope, but some, you know, some piecewise polytrope, yeah. basically sure. discretizing that. Um, yeah, this is the what equation is of state done. in some sense. But yeah. so, so you say this way you can surely also constrain the parameters of that model, say macrophysics, which is interesting. But I was more thinking about the, the equation of state itself, how that would change if you do it this way or if you do it, do it the other way. Um, and so, is this roughly yeah. similar or do, do you see qualitative differences there? No, I think uh, what you're talking about is something which is already being done currently. Like all the, for example, this, um, when we talked about the uh, plot of, yeah, for example, this uh, plot of um, tidal deformability and uh, equation of state. So, uh, I mean, in principle, if you take realistic equations of state or if you take piecewise polytropic equations of state, these these are the kind of studies that are currently being done already by the LIGO verbal community. But uh, the motivation of this work was particularly to identify identify which among these uh, nuclear observable parameters can we actually say has a dominant role in determining um, uh, of the observables or whether or not there is a connection between symmetry energy and its slope and the observables and so on. Okay, I understand. But I mean, you, you could also then plot what is the equation of state from the analysis you did, right? Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. But the, I mean, the, the idea behind the correlations was to identify the dominant, uh, uh, I mean, the major sources of uncertainty in the model and so on. Okay, yeah, of I, I fully I understand, think... and this is nice. I, I just wonder whether this has any qualitative differences then that you can say, well, we constrain, constrain things more if we have a more fancy model for more fancy parameterization. And this, I don't know, at certain densities will then impose a stronger, constrained on the equation of state, for instance, that's that was kind of my question. Uh, I think if you plot equations of state, there would still be degeneracies, right? Like, because for example, when we have, when I'm showing this range of nuclear parameters, we are, if we vary all of them simultaneously, there is still a degeneracy. So um, I think we cannot, uh, I mean, uh, the, the degeneracy at this level cannot be removed, whereas imposing filters gives us some handle on the uh, role of the parameters themselves. That is what was basically the idea of this work. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay, thanks, Kai, for the uh, question and contribution. And thank uh, David to you for the talk. Is If there is any other question we can take, Seems not. So we thank you again for this very nice talk and uh, see you on our next talks. Bye you. to you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, you very much.